And there's books and there's memes and there's poems and there's everything that tells us the harder it is, the more we're going to learn and grow from it. And that's true, right? Of course, we have all grown from hardship. But I'm really interested in something a little gentler and a whole lot more joyful. And in the idea, even even looking straight in the eyes of the idea that I can grow without having to hurt. This is your Kick-Ass Life Podcast, episode number 320 with guest Jeanette LeBlanc. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host, the girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, ass kickers. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am so glad that you are here. Applications are open for the Mentorship Masterclass, which is my signature program. If you loved or liked or it kind of hit you in the gut, my book, How to Stop Feeling Like Shit, then you will for sure love this program. Even if you haven't read the book, let me just tell you quickly who this is for. It's for women who know that vulnerability is really kind of the key (laughs) that's going to make them happier and have more confidence, but they're not exactly sure how to do it, or they think it's a good idea, but just haven't done it yet. You love personal development, but maybe have a hard time implementing because you don't have accountability, or you're not sure exactly what in your life are the things to do. This program is fantastic for people who have a really hard time having hard conversations, and instead just continue to people please and feel resentful and have of poor boundaries, women like that. So if any of that spoke to you, head on over and check it out, yourkickasslife.com slash mentorship. All of the details are there, all of the logistics, and there is no hidden things on that page. Everything is there. But of course, if you have questions, you can always reach out to us. It is application only. I want to make sure that it is a great fit for you. And I so look forward to seeing your application and hopefully seeing you in the mentorship. All right. Today, we have a return guest. Jeanette LeBlanc is back on the show today, and I was thinking about the past guests that I have had and what I want for 2020, and I was kind of thinking, you know, what are the similarities or patterns that I'm seeing in the podcast episodes just in general, whether it's a solo episode, a coaching episode, or I have a guest on, or a conversation about shit that matters with unqualified people. Really what I want, of course, at the end of the day is to provide you with value, to provide you an insight that you might not already have, something to make you think about something a little bit differently, and just at the end of the day, hopefully to provide you with tools and resources to help you live, wait for it, to help you live your kick-ass life. A few weeks ago, we had Dr. Valerie on talking about something unusual that I had never heard about before, patriarchy stress disorder. Last week, we had a coaching episode with a woman named Erica who was talking about her money struggles. I know a lot of you related to that. And this week, I'm having Jeanette on because what I feel like Jeanette provides is another way for you to help yourself. Let me just read her bio really quick. Jeanette spent most of her life working very hard to be a good girl. One day she woke up and decided to write her way out of her own life. Things haven't been the same since. Single mama to two ridiculously unruly daughters, Jeanette believes in the smooth honey burn of whiskey, the crashing of mama ocean, pencil skirts, vintage band tees and fringed boots, the kinship of the wild wolf, walking for miles in unfamiliar cities, and the burn down always precedes the rise, the singular power of dark red lipstick, and the necessity of putting out for the muse on the regular. Oh yeah, and that sometimes our stories are the only things that can save us. I mean, it's poetry all the time from Jeanette. That's just what you're going to get. But on the last episode that she was on, we did talk about writing and how it can help you, as she says in her bio, that sometimes our stories are the only thing that can save us. We'll throw that link in the show notes. But today we're talking about her book and we're talking about more specific topics and just how they relate to being human. 
one exciting thing is that we're doing a giveaway for Jeanette's book. All you need to do is head on over to my Instagram feed, instagram.com slash your kickass life. It's all one word over there on the gram. And you're going to find the post where I am talking about this episode. And tell us what was your biggest takeaway from the episode? We are going to pick a winner at random to win a copy of Jeanette's book. So without further ado, here is Jeanette. Jeanette, thanks for coming back on the show. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to talk to you today because like me, you are really into telling the truth. And that's something that my audience loves. I think about me that I'm not this type of expert that's up on a pedestal telling them how to live their lives (laughs) and just do it like me. I have no problems. And, but instead just come out with the truth and you are such a fantastic example of that. So thank you for all of that. Thank you. And I know that's why I love you. Yeah. There's just something about, well, I mean, that really brings me to the first question I wanted to to ask you, and that's, you know, you and I were talking before the show, obviously, about truth telling and and coincidentally, I don't even think that you posted this on Facebook because we had talked yet about this, but let's start with you reading what you posted on Facebook just this morning. Yeah, I had just posted that this morning, but I wrote 2020 goal to tell the truth so relentlessly, to write my way straight through the taboos and out of all the remaining closets so that there is nothing left that I cannot say. Wow. What made you write that? That's what I'm curious about. I think because, I mean, I've been doing this a long time. I've been writing online for almost 20 years. No, 20 years. Oh, wow. Um, So long before blogs, before social media, before all of that was happening. And it's been a continual progression, but this fall, especially um, the last six months, I kind of hit that no lingering shame, no more fucks to give. Uh huh. Um, Which I think happens to a lot of us, especially when we reach our forties. Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. Uh, and so, just being in that place now of, of really wanting to get to the place where there isn't anything that's holding me back anymore. Because the only thing that, that holds me back right now is me and, and the lingering truths that I haven't addressed or haven't told. And so there's this deep desire in me to just say these last remaining things, not uh-huh. that they're a secret, but that I haven't addressed publicly yet. So that then it's no, it's truly no holds barred. And I can speak about my whole life with complete openness and transparency. And there's a deep desire in me to get to that place. Okay. Well, then let's back up for a minute because you say, I think that you say this on your website, that you spent most of your life working hard, working very hard to be a good girl. So, because I'm curious, people might meet you and think, oh, has she always been this way? And you said you've been writing online for 20 years. That's a long ass time. But you haven't always been the kind of person who just pours out your truth super easy and is transparent about everything, right? Absolutely not. So I am a small town Canadian preacher's kid which I know comes with all people have a whole lot of projections about what that means. Uh, And I'm the oldest of four. And I had a whole lot invested in being the good daughter, the good kid, the good mother, all of those things, like creating this image and holding it all together and keeping it all really contained and was always at war with that other side of myself that was raw and open and, and ready um, and craving kind of the edges of things. So I feel like I spent the first half of my life or more than the first half of my life trying to contain and box in kind of the wild of me. And then at some point, mm-hmm. <laughs> I just left that all behind. Did, was there like a moment or moments where you kind of, I like to say like you get a case of the fuckets or do you, was it like a slow progression? I think it was both. I mean, I think for all of us, this evolution of life, like especially if we speak of, from our 20s to our 40s, there is this slow evolution slash revolution where we come into ourselves and step into ourselves and our power over time. And it can't happen quickly. And then there are these pivotal moments, like these make or break points where you have decisions to make. Like I can either keep doing it the way I have done it, Mm -hmm. or I can start a new story. So for me, that happened in my early thirties when, um, so again, being a good girl, I went to yeah. college, I got a science degree, I graduated, you know, high in my class, I married the most handsome man. Um, right out of college, we had beautiful babies, I lived in a really nice house in a nice suburb, 
upper middle class, like the perfect little life, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever had been lined up for me from birth. (laughs) The only plan that I knew was a stay at home mom, um, all of that. And then I came to terms, I, I came to this place to one of those pivotal points where I had to come to terms with my sexuality and with being queer, which to mm-hmm. me meant uh, a huge break with the whole life that I've lived so far. And, and I came face to face with that choice. I can either continue to push this down or I can step into what's true, which means burning down everything I knew. And okay. that was the pivotal point. Is coming out to your husband and to everybody and then asking for a divorce? All of that. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, and as we've talked candidly about before, and I've shared candidly online, I didn't move through that progression with the kind of bravery and integrity that I would expect of myself. Mm -hmm. Looking back, you would have done it differently. You mean, (laughs) this is why I like to, because I don't know this part. Like, I don't know that whole story. Okay. And I may not go into the whole, whole story. (laughs) Well, I think it's interesting for people to hear because I, I think people, might be living their life and they have a truth to tell. And it may not be about their sexuality. It may be that they've always longed to travel the world and their partner has no desire to do that, or they want to leave their job as an attorney and open up a nonprofit to save the animals in Australia or or something big inside of them that they want to confront. (laughs) And, And maybe that's the wrong word. It feels like a very aggressive word, but they don't know how to go about it. So I think you talking about both the emotional and mental and spiritual kind of turmoil that was going on. And then also logistically, how did it look and what would you do differently? So, and this is why I was going to say why I tend, I have spoken openly about this before. I call total bullshit on the whole no regrets. Me too. (laughs) Of course I have things I would do differently. I absolutely regret how I walked through that year of my life. I did. I do the best I could with what I had. I'm not sure that's true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, there's that whole thing. If you know better, you do better. If you had known better, you'd do better. I could have done better and I didn't. And and it took me 12 years to live into any kind of self-forgiveness for that was not fast. So that year kind of felt like someone rolled me up in like a rug. Yeah. And threw me, you know, underwater in the ocean and I just spun and, you know, snowballed. You can, I can layer every metaphor in here. Right. Um, (laughs) But I, I, I started spinning with my eyes closed and six months later I woke up and my entire life had burned to the ground by my own doing. Which I think that's how a lot of people handle big things like that. I think so. It takes, it, it takes a wild amount of courage to step into a life transition. And it does not have to be a divorce. Like you said, it doesn't have to be a divorce. It doesn't have to be coming out. It doesn't have to be any of that. Um, I had shared with you, there's a Ted talk we'd both seen mm-hmm. by Ask Beckham where uh, the line that I go back to again and again is all a closet is, is a hard conversation. So we all yeah. have closets. Every one of us quite likely is in some kind of closets. I am wildly open online and I tell a lot of truths and I still have closets. Yes. I I think we all do. And I, and I love, and I do want to dove that dovetail it into your fantastic book, which is available now. You are not too much notes, love notes on heartache, redemption, and reclamation, which I'm going to go ahead and assume that this book has been, and I don't know how far back this writing goes, but it's been sort of uh, a culmination of your writing as you have come out, quote unquote, come out of your own closets and written your way through your life. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. I don't think there's any, there's nothing in there that's pre that transition. It's all been since then. And there's been closets since then. (laughs) Shopify's already taken the cash register online, helping millions sell billions around the world. But did you know that Shopify can do the same thing at your retail store? Give your point of sale system a serious upgrade with Shopify. With Shopify, you get a powerhouse selling partner that effortlessly unites your in-person and online sales into one source of truth. Track every sale across your business in one place and know exactly what's in stock. Connect with customers inline and online. Shopify helps you drive store traffic with plug-and-play tools built for marketing campaigns from TikTok to Instagram and beyond. Get hardware that fits your business. Take payments by smartphone, transform your tablet into a point-of-sale system, or use Shopify's POS Go mobile device for a battle-tested solution. 
Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash noise, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash noise to take your retail business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash noise. Fast forward to the end of 2024 and think about your goals. What can you do right now to give yourself the best chance of succeeding? If you want to learn a new language, you absolutely should get Babbel. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Now it's so easy to speak simple conversation phrases with the guy that takes care of my lawn without having to consult language apps. Here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash noise. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash noise, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash noise. Rules and restrictions may apply. Yeah, and we'll throw in the show notes the link to the TED Talk, to obviously to Jeanette's book. And then when you were on here last time talking about writing and how therapeutic that can be, and because I know that's a, that's been a, a huge integral part of your of your healing. And this is not to say that all of you listening need to go and tell all of your truth online <laughs> to the entire world. It's not for everyone. Absolutely not. I think being brave and truth telling can be as simple as between you and the voice in your head, or you writing in your journal. I mean. Writing the truth for the first time, putting it on paper, even if nobody sees it, even if you're writing it in the air in front of you, I don't care. You you know, I use the term writing, but I really just mean this acknowledgement of what is true for you. That is the first step and the most important step. I love, and that TED talk was incredibly powerful. And I love that she uses her own coming out as gay, really just as an example of having a hard conversation. And I, and trust me, like I was the mayor of let's not talk about anything town. (laughs) Let's just have a whole lot of fun and like not talk about the hard stuff, but in coming to my own realization and, you know, I've been doing this for like 15 years now of learning, not just having the hard conversations, but learning how to have hard conversations in a way that makes me feel proud of how I'm showing up. Mm-hmm. that really takes the most courage. I do think it's, it is a two-parter. It's being honest with yourself first and foremost, and then also having that conversation with, with so many people. What do you think has helped you the most in terms of being able to not only tell the truth to yourself first, but to quote unquote, come out of these closets that, that you've lived in in your life? This is the most boring answer ever. <laughs> practice. I have a feeling. Yeah. I was like, I know what she's going to say, <laughs> well, but please say more about it. Cause your, your practice might look different than mine. Right. And I think the thing is if you've lived this, so if you, if you are like me, if you're listening in the audience and you're like, Oh yeah, I've, I've done this good girl thing. Like I've been super invested in being whatever your version of that good girl is mm-hmm. um, of maintaining the status quo, of fitting inside the lines, you know, whatever that is. You're not going to come out necessarily of the biggest, the biggest, hardest, most walled in closet first. We've got to start with some small things. Usually Mm -hmm. practice telling the truth about where you want to eat dinner. Yeah. How you like your (laughs) eggs, how you like your eggs. It is amazing when you talk to women and I'm sure you've had this experience when you ask that question, what do you want? And they don't know. And And this blank look comes, this almost fear deer in headlights look, because we have not been asked that our whole lives. Mm -mm. We've not only not asked that. Do you know know how to take care of everybody else and know what they want? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that question, I think sometimes that's the very first question you ask, what do I want? And you may not know the answer at first. Mm -hmm. It may take a while of living and writing and working and experiencing to even be able to answer what that is. You have that, you know, that nagging feeling inside you, there's something more. So maybe you don't know that you want to travel the world. You don't know that you want to 
come out of the sexuality closet or you don't know, I want to leave my safe job or my husband or whatever it is, but you just know that there's something inside of you that doesn't fit where you are, Mm -hmm. that you're bigger than the limits that have been placed on you and you're bigger than the limits you placed on yourself. I sort of feel like And tell me if you agree with me or not. Like, I sort of feel like most women come to that sort of revelation sometime in their life. Don't you think? I do. I, I, I think that they do. I think that, I think that almost all of us are presented with that space and we get to choose if we step into it or not, or how Mm -hmm. far we step into it. And it's interesting to me how much suffering and bullshit a woman can take before she will walk away from a situation that she's not happy in. And I'm not just saying relationships. It could be a job. It could be really anything. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're preaching right there for sure. (laughs) Um, Because I think we have been this, there's this cultural assumption that what makes us strong is enduring. Right. How much can we bear? How much can you hold up? Mm-hmm. without dropping any of the other balls. And that's where your value lies. Mm-hmm. I'm really interested in, 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 in a place of inquiry in my writing and my life of separating myself from the myth that my suffering is the, is the point of growth. Say that again. That was really powerful. I am really, really invested in, in just this place of inquiry, this myth that we have in our culture that our growth comes from our suffering. Mm-hmm. I think because that, yeah, because we're applauded for that. Right. And, and there's books and there's memes and there's poems and there's everything that tells us the harder it is, the more we're going to learn and grow from it. And that's true, right? Of course, we have all grown from hardship. But I'm really interested in something a little gentler and a whole lot more joyful. And in the idea, even, even looking straight in the eyes of the idea that I can grow without having to hurt. Yeah. It doesn't have to be so hard. It doesn't. We talk we talk a lot about that in the circles of creativity mm-hmm. where we make up many of us, and by we, I mean creatives, and that's really all of you listening. <laughs> you don't have to be artistic to be creative. But I think a lot of us who are, you know, songwriters or writers or painters or quilters or whatever that like there has to be some kind of suffering involved for it to be beautiful and for it to be meaningful and valuable. And that's simply not true. It the same is true for life. Mm-hmm. Like what if it could be peaceful and easy? I know that's an Eagle song, right? <laughs> <laughs> but what if it could? And it's, well, I want to sort of circle back to that sort of line in the sand because, and as I said, I think so many women come to that place sooner or later in their life. It's an interesting place to be, I think, where we finally come to that realization where we need to say something. And I think that that conversation can be, can feel impossible, even with the people that we love. Because I think about, and I I feel like we've talked about this before. Our kids are coming up in a world where we have conversations and we've given them language about boundaries and consent and um, autonomy Mm -hmm. and sovereignty and, and, they have a framework to work within. Most women I know in their forties did not get raised with that. No. So stepping into a conversation, like even like the one you just mentioned, a difficult conversation where you have the anxiety in your body because you're going to set a boundary or you're going to shift the way things have been. You're going to change the status quo. That's terrifying. Um, And then be willing to look at the metaphors and the analogies and the the ways you compare yourself to things in life and how you fit into it and actually being willing to break it down and to write a different story. Yes. I love that. And it it makes me think of something that you had mentioned before we started talking that I think is important for the listeners to hear because we, we talk about how you have created a life for yourself where there's not a ton of risk for you to speak out and have these hard conversations or speak out online about your truth. And that's not the case for everyone. Yes. And so, and I think that's, it's such an important thing to, to address. So there's people out there and we live pretty open lives online. We've worked for a long time. We have platforms of varying degrees. We have people listening to us and watching us. And I'm sure you do, you as well, get a lot of, a lot of kudos for being brave or being bold or for speaking the truth. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that 
not that this has come without cost, but that I've created a life of freedom. I don't have a boss. I currently do not have a partner. I have way past the point where I'm worried if my family is going to take or leave me based on what I write online. Um, there's, yes, it's always a risk to speak the truth. It's always scary. Every truth I tell is singular and stands on its own. There's always that deep breath inhale before I push publish. However, I have created a life that's very much unlike most people out there. I have a tremendous amount of freedom. I am not taking the same risks when I post, you know, I just posted this week uh, an essay about coming out as non-monogamous. Mm -hmm. There are people for whom that could be a job risk or a life risk or make or unsafe in some way to talk about those things. And so I feel a level of responsibility to speak and be a voice for all of the people out there who cannot, who cannot possibly do what I do. Mm -hmm. What are you hoping that they gain from reading your writing? I think what happens, and because I've done this for a long time and I've gotten a lot of feedback and a lot of messages, um, what happens is, so we can, we can kind of revisit my coming out time and how I started in that pivotal moment. I, I got up one late, late at night, you know, teary eyed, just broken hearted. How am I going to do that? It feels like either I have to lose him or lose me. And how do you make that choice? Mm -hmm. And I started frantically Googling and looking for my story somewhere. I wanted to find someone like me. I needed to know I wasn't alone in this just kind of vast, brokenhearted, confused space. And I couldn't find my story anywhere. So I remember this moment of going, okay, then I need to write this. Because if I'm up late at night searching for this story, there's someone else up late at night who is desperate yeah. to find themselves in, in words. And so I started, it was anonymous at first, and I, that gave me the opportunity to speak really, really openly about things I never would have written otherwise, mm -hmm. um, probably at a level that I'm not even writing now because there was no holdback. I didn't have to worry about my children or... So this was like pre-Facebook? It was pre Probably it was 2008. So Facebook was just kind of starting. And, and you were still on MySpace. I'm still on MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> I have tried to find my MySpace and log in because I feel like there's a treasure trove of oh my God. Of myself there. But I think I closed mine, but I saved all the pictures because it was all just like pictures of me drinking. And although I looked damn good. I will say that. <laughs> I imagine you did it. <laughs> um, so you, you created an anonymous blog to tell yeah. your story because you couldn't find it online and people just found me. And that, again, mm -hmm. that was the days I think, you know, back when you started writing too, when blogs yeah. were, you could actually build a platform by writing a blog. Yeah. Um, if you build it, they did come. <laughs> yeah. Back then they did. Mm -hmm. No longer the case. And what I learned from that is that we are hungry to find, I mean, that's the reason that storytelling is the oldest is the oldest form of language way right? to teach mm -hmm. the beginning of teaching of language of, of sharing ourselves. We are desperate in this world of separation and division to find ourselves inside of someone else's story to create these points of connection. And that's what it does. Um, I might, you know, you might not be able to create, it's what happens to me in music when I couldn't write music. I don't know how to play anything. <laughs> yeah. But when I hear a song that perfectly says, what I'm feeling and where the music stirs that feeling that lets me access another part of myself, I feel like someone sees and knows me mm -hmm. I'm a little less alone. And I think that that's the whole goal of the writing as well. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, that's how I feel about Florence and the machine. And like, I don't know if there's any other concert where I've seen the audience cry as much as people are when they're at one of her concerts. I mean, I know there are tons of musicians that that happens to, but it's, it, it's so incredibly true. Well, and that brings me to another question I have for you because you do sort of have this magnetism about you and what is it in you that women see that they want to cultivate in themselves? What do you think that is? And perhaps they've told you. I think it just comes back to this whole conversation. It is that willingness to step into a level of radical honesty and, and there is no... I want to make it perfectly clear that there is no blame in this. And I'm saying that most people are not doing because we've mm -hmm. already said most people cannot show up at the level of honesty that I am perfectly yeah. honest now. But I think there is something, you know, there's, um, there's a quote and I will have to look it up um, who said this, but it's, it's basically paraphrased. What happens when one woman tells the truth about herself, the whole world cracks open. 
So I might have totally butchered that. Sounds fantastic. I believe you. (laughs) But I think that that's it. I think that we are drawn to people who are living honestly. So whether it means that they are dressing super honestly, like you see someone out there who is just rocking their bad selves in this Mm -hmm. outfit, you wouldn't dare wear, you know, if your life depended on it. Or you see someone who is killing their career at a level of bravery and discipline that you haven't been able to muster. You see someone telling really true, hard stories. Whatever it is, I think we are... Uh, we're just so drawn to that. And especially now in this social media age where we've gotten so inundated with the highlight reel or yeah. the prettied up version, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, where everything looks pretty and pink and perfect and filtered. And so whenever someone shows up with a different level of honesty or takes you to a different level, I think that that is magnetic. We lean forward into that. I love that. I have my own board of directors. It was an exercise that was given to me in a mastermind that I was in. And you basically, and it doesn't have to be women. It can be anyone who it's your imaginary board of directors. And of course it's all badasses on mine, but there's, there's a few, cause I also, there's like characters from movies that I love for their, cause what you're describing to me is leadership and, and people, my listeners might have listened to the podcast episode where it's, it's called an ode to Chacha de Gregorio because from Greece, like, she's like one of the most hated characters, but I've always loved her so much because she is so unapologetic about what a great dancer she is. Mm-hmm. Like it's the most important thing to her. Totally unapologetic. Today's podcast is sponsored by Midi Health. Ladies, are you over 40 like me and dealing with hot flashes, insomnia, brain fog, moodiness, some vaginal dryness, or weight gain? Don't just accept it as part of aging. These symptoms are often linked to hormonal changes during perimenopause and menopause. At Midi Health, they get it. Their experts know what you're going through and how to help. Midi clinicians are menopause specialists offering safe, effective, FDA-approved solutions. And guess what? Midi Care is covered by insurance. So stop pushing through it alone. Schedule a virtual visit and dive deep into your unique symptoms and health background. You'll walk away feeling heard and with a plan to start feeling better. Visit Midi Health today and reclaim your well being. You deserve to feel great. Book your virtual visit today at joinmidi.com. That's joinmidi.com. Joinmidi.com. It's hard to find a great mentor who can help me level up. My dream mentor, Shonda Rhimes. So I was really excited when I heard she has a class on Masterclass. With Masterclass, you can learn from the best to become your best. Masterclass is the only streaming platform where you can learn and grow with over 200 plus of the world's best. For just $10 a month, an annual membership with Masterclass gets you unlimited access to every instructor. And you can access Masterclass on your phone, computer, smart TV, or even in audio mode. I'm always looking for ways to be a better writer, so I took Shonda Rhimes screenwriting class. It helped me gain concrete technical advice, including structuring, the writing process, and with shows under her belt like Grey's Anatomy and Bridgerton, it was so helpful. Plus, every new membership comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Don't wait another moment to start your learning journey with Masterclass. Right now, our listeners get an additional 15% off any annual membership at masterclass.com slash Andrea. That's 15% off at masterclass.com slash Andrea. Masterclass.com slash Andrea. Also, Moira Rose from Schitt's Creek and the way she dresses and does her makeup And that she's an older woman. Like she gives zero fucks wearing like gold lame dresses. (laughs) And it's like so overdressed. And then also, have you seen that Netflix show? I'm almost embarrassed to say that we've watched several episodes of it. It's called Cheer. I have not. Okay. It's about, it's about, I was surprised my husband sat down and watched it with me. It's about this community college in a small town in Texas that has won the national championship for cheer for like, I don't even know how many years in a row. It's like a decade or something. And they have this coach. And the minute I saw her and I was like, oh my God, like I almost wanted to fall at her feet because I knew exactly the type that she was. And she's so unapologetic about her ambition. And 
she has just led this team to championship after championship and they love her. She's not mean or hateful or anything. She, she, they just love her. And I do think that for women, there is something about women like that who are unapologetic. And I, and I think that for some of us, we grow up to hate them Mm -hmm. and talk badly about them and all so many things, so many negative connotations to them. And for me, it felt so freeing and exciting to look up to them and with such admiration for in many ways, giving the middle finger to, to, to the world that tells them that they're wrong. Mm-hmm. And, and it is, it's ingrained in the culture. So if you own your sexuality, you're a slut. If you post selfies, you're, you're searching for desperate validation there's, there's a million different, if you are a high powered business owner, you're probably a bitch, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. we, and we women do this to each other too. A hundred percent. Yep. Uh, so it is amazing. And I, I, so I have a little exercise and a little fun exercise people can do. I, I fully believe like you have your whole board of directors, which is amazing. Um, I have people in my workshops create their alter egos. Okay. I read a book about that and it was really interesting to me. Yeah. Um, and I will just say, I know the book and I've, I've been doing it for a long time. <laughs> I've only read like two thirds of it. I got, I was kind of over it. I was like, I get it. <laughs> I've been my workshops like for a long, long time. Um, and I have my alter ego. So my alter, like my real self is, was a good girl. Mm-hmm. My real life self. Yes. I live on the edges and I speak truth in the edges of things, but I'm still pretty, I'm still pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> People tell me all the time I'm adorable and I want to just give them a middle finger. Like, no, no I'm not a badass. <laughs> oh. But my alter ego is a true badass. Mm-hmm. She is, she's a leather wearing, chain smoking, zero fucks to give bitch. She is. And so one of the exercises I have people do is to kind of envision that alter ego and then to make a playlist for your alter ego. Yeah. So find all the songs that speak to that part of yourself and your alter ego is is quite likely braver and bolder and wiser and Mm -hmm. more vocal than you. She knows what she wants. She's not afraid to go get it. Um, And so for me, when I hit those points where I'm like, oh, I'm not really feeling brave. I'm feeling kind of like tender and unsure of myself. Even the simple act of either putting on some clothes that she would wear or playing, putting my playlist on helps me get back into that brave space. So I actually have these, kind of little rituals I will take to embody because she's me. She's yeah. not, not me. She is me. Of course, your whole, your whole board of directors is you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those. Cause we're, we're made up of different parts. We exactly. have shadow sides. Yes. So many sides. You wouldn't have picked those people if they weren't in you. Um, mm-hmm. But sometimes I do, I need to channel and bring her in more so that I can hit the next level of bravery or truth telling or radical honesty that I want to hit. I love that. I love that so much. And I've, I've done, and this is, I think part of one, one of the many reasons I loved roller derby so much is because we, and, and a lot of people argue against this and say it bastardizes the sport by having derby names. And I, I totally get that and love that people will just skate under their, their real name, but that we could because it is an um, unusual sport, I think, for women. It's because it's aggressive and it, it, I do think it allows women to have that alter ego if they feel like they need it. And I certainly did at the time. And, and Veronica Vane was that for me. And I still, I, I still have my jersey and I still, you know, when I'm l- looking through my workout clothes and I, I see it and smile and think of her. But I, I think that that is such a fantastic exercise for people. And I, I hope that everyone does that. I want, I want to circle back to this book because I love it so much. I'm gifting it to my clients. You are not too much love notes on heartache, redemption, and reclamation. And I know that we had mentioned that you've sort of been writing this for years now. And I'm curious you know, because you're a writer, you could have written so many different books, but why love notes? I think because, so I, what I did when I started to think about, okay, first radical transparency, right? I wanted to get a book out and the easiest way to get a book out was for me to call through writing I'd already done. So first yeah. of <laughs> don't reinvent the wheel. <laughs> it was, what's the most low hanging fruit so I can get over this fear in me, this block that is keeping me from taking the next step in my career as a writer and author. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, so I, then I started combing through my thing, my writing that was collected online and, you know, in word docs and all social media for so many years. 
And what I realized was I'm always, I'm always in some ways writing to myself, but I'm always in some ways writing really specifically to someone out there who I know needs those words, just like that me of 12 years ago, sitting up at night, frantically searching. So I know what I'm writing. There is someone out there who's going to take what I write and be able to apply it and take it into their life. And it's going to be what they need. Mm -hmm. So it it came it became clear to me in that process that I'd been writing love notes. I'd been writing love letters to the world, to myself, to women, uh, for all of these years, and it just seemed like the perfect and most natural heading to put this under. And so I didn't want to write a book that went chronologically through chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, because that's not how life works. Right. I wanted to write a book that you could leave on your copy table and open up to a page. And then, and just read that page in isolation in your busy day, or you can throw it in your purse. You could have it when, you know, when you're waiting for the kids at practice and you can open it up and go, okay, what does this page have to, how does it speak to me and my life and what's happening right now? What is universal in this? And even what do I not agree with on this page? Mm -hmm. Um, Because these writings were collected over such a long period of time. The other process that I went through in collecting them was, oh, I don't actually still believe everything I've written. It's not true for me and my life and my evolution anymore, but it still is universally true. There's still universal heart and soul in it, and it still belongs in the book because it will be true for somebody at the place that they're at right now. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you so much for writing it, and thank you for taking your time to be on here today. I just want to ask you one more question. Mm -hmm. I used to ask this to all of my guests and I haven't asked it in a while, but it feels so appropriate to ask you. And the question is, what surprises you about the women that you work with? Ooh, that's a good one. And it's hard when you've been doing work for so long to be surprised, right? Right. I am surprised continually still always by the amount of strength, by the amount of resilience, by the level of grace and tenacity and badassery Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, and just, just the way we keep showing up. Uh, So I think I had mentioned to you, I think six or 700 women have gone through my workshops in the past uh, six or seven years, which means that I have heard and my body holds um, more trauma stories than I can count because, Mm because to hold women's stories is to hold trauma. And then I look at this collection of collection of women and I have a community called the Wild Heart Writers community that, um, that is built around these workshops. And, and the fact, number one, that we're all still standing. Right. It's a goddamn miracle. But not just standing, making art and creating lives and, and, and growing and changing and evolving and showing up and showing up and showing up and showing up, and showing up is just absolutely mind-blowing. I don't ever want to be, I don't want to ever stop being surprised by that because it's the most beautiful yeah. and inspiring surprise of all. Yeah. And it sounds like, and I, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds to me, it's just the being in awe of the beauty of that tenacity mm-hmm. and grit. Absolutely. I also think about the stories and sometimes the traumatic ones of the women who came before us, your mother's 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 mother and on and on and on. When I stop to think about that, to truly think about that all the way back to the beginning of time, for one, it's a miracle that we're here. Absolutely. Given the struggle and strife that so many of our grandmothers, great, great grandmothers have had to go through and that you know, to, to be able to stand on their shoulders. Like it overwhelms me to the point of tears many times. And, and this next book that I'm writing is, is for all of those mothers. But that to me in many times of fear pushes me to tell my truth mm-hmm. and speak it out, you know, come out of closets for them because they most likely did not have that freedom and opportunity. Exactly. And I want to say too, Women, like any anyone listening, and, and as a queer human, I use the word women in a, in a really wide open kind of way, female identified humans. That's important to me to say. We are the, we are continually and have always raised ourselves up from shaky ground. We have been the change makers. We have been the paradigm shifters. We have been the ones that have, have taken like the rubble and rebuilt over and over and over again. We are made for this. Mm -hmm. 
like, like you said, all of that genetic imprint, the epigenetics, the memories of all of those people that came before you are in you. And you are actually made for this time right now. Um, someone this year called me a permission leader. And I think it's one of my favorite things that I've ever been called. And you put it in my bio. <laughs> I love it too. Because I feel like that's what I'm here for. I'm here to give you this radical permission to be, do, say, dance, live, fuck, love, however, and whoever, and wherever, and whenever is most authentically you. Mm-hmm. Yes. Amen. Preacher's daughter preaching. Preacher's daughter preaching. <laughs> like you can take the preacher's daughter out of the church, but you can't take the church out of the preacher's daughter. It's in me. Oh, thank you, Jeanette, so much. Again, you are not too much. Love notes on heartache, redemption, and reclamation. The link is in the bio. Where do you want people to go to find you? My website is just JeanetteLeBlanc.com, and I am mostly on Instagram and Facebook. Again, just under my name, and I'm sure we can put the links of that in there. Of course. Thank you so much. And everyone listening, you know how valuable I think your time is. So I'm honored and grateful that you choose to spend it with me and my guests. And until next time, I will see you all out in cyberspace. Bye-bye. I'd like to introduce you to the Minimalist Moms podcast. It's hard enough being a mom, and the last thing you need is stress from too much stuff and an overcrowded schedule. For too long, I lived with the mindset that bigger was better, and the more I added to my life, instead of feeling better, I felt overwhelmed. It was time for a radical new mindset. Less is more. I'm not into extremes. I didn't throw everything away. My brand of minimalism is more about adding than subtracting. Get rid of the excess to make room for what you love. In other words, it's about living life with purpose. I hope you'll listen in and my guest and myself can inspire you to think more and do with less. The Minimalist Moms Podcast, available wherever you listen to podcasts.